and lost. Jesus came to seek and save sinners, who we are, and Jesus also came to seek the lost, and that describes us. But part of the reason, the main reason that we get together each week to do this in remembrance of Jesus is because of what he's done. And accepting what he's done, recognizing what he's done, has a lot to do with our mindset and our heart and where we're at. And if you would, turn with me to, um, if you want to follow along, to Luke chapter 6. <clears throat> Luke chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. Jesus has just uh, spent some time in prayer. He's come, he's come down from the mountain. He's <clears throat> named his, his apostles. He has a large crowd of people around him. He turns to his disciples and he says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. <clears throat> and we'll stop right there. <clears throat> Blessed are you who are poor. <clears throat> when we first hear that, we think, well, maybe in your own life, you think, I've been poor, and I didn't feel like I was very blessed. <clears throat> but what's, what's he talking about? The word there for poor <clears throat> refers to someone who has nothing. And we know he's talking about spiritual poverty. He's talking about people who recognize their spiritual poverty. They recognize their bankruptcy. Their need for Jesus, their need for, <clears throat> for salvation, their need for um, <clears throat> someone to pay the price for them. That's the poverty he's talking about. And then he goes on, <clears throat> and this is where the hunger comes in. He says, blessed are you who hunger now. And again, maybe you can think of your time, a time in your life when you were hungry. I think most of us, might not, maybe not all of us, but I know personally, we were poor growing up, but I've never been hungry. You know, So, so hunger is not something that we... Can relate to that well in America, because we are so abundantly so abundantly blessed. And so, when you're hungry for something, what do you what do you do? You you seek it out, right? You want to seek to fulfill that need. We have an expression that's come into uh, our society here recently called "we're hangry." It's a combination of hungry and angry. Our stomach's grumbling. We want food. Our blood sugar's low. So, when you're hungry, you seek something. <clears throat> what is the blessing of that hunger? Jesus says, for you will be satisfied. <clears throat> and so again, we know he's not talking about a physical hunger here. He's talking about a hungry, <clears throat> or a hunger, Luke doesn't specify it, but Matthew in his account says, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so <clears throat> your spiritual poverty, recognizing where you are before the Lord, your sinful state, your need for forgiveness, your need for salvation, that leads you to hunger for spiritual things. <clears throat> and that's what he's talking about here. <clears throat> you hunger and thirst for righteousness. You recognize you're spiritually poor, so you actively seek to fill that spiritual gnawing. If you're not hungry for something, you're certainly not going to go after it. <clears throat> then what's the blessing of this type of hunger? He says, blessed are you who hunger now. What's the blessing of having a spiritual hunger? He says, for you will be satisfied. That word there, satisfied, is interesting. It literally means foddered up. It refers to the way animals eat. Most of us don't eat until we're stuffed, if you think about it. I mean, we, for various reasons, health, appearance, we eat. We, we, we're specific with what we eat, when we eat it, and we eat in uh, specified portions and that type of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but foddered up, that refers to the way an animal eats. An animal eats without control because animals don't know when the next time is they're going to eat. And so they literally eat until they're stuffed. Now when I was younger and competing in powerlifting, I could do a 22 ounce porterhouse with a salad bar and dessert and I'd be comfortably full. But then I'd be hungry again two hours later. I was foddered up, you know. <clears throat> That's not <clears throat> what he's talking about. We don't stuff ourselves. Animals, they don't have that concern. They eat until they're gorged. A large great white shark can eat a couple hundred pounds in a mouthful. You know, and they just go, and they go until they're gorged. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He says, you're going to be so satisfied. It's like he says over in another passage, your cup's going to be shaken together, pressed down, filled to overflowing. That's how satisfied spiritually you're going to be. You can't take anymore. I'm going to satisfy you so fully, so completely. That's how satisfied your spiritual hunger is going to be. And so he has literally met every spiritual need that we have through his death, burial, and resurrection. <clears throat> and that's what he means. That's the blessing of being spiritually hungry. And so one of our challenges, I think, there's a lot of things, and the guys bring so many great points when we get together here on Sunday mornings. One of the things that we need to look at when we have the Lord's Supper is look at the condition of our heart. Are we sp 
spiritually poor? Do we recognize our spiritual need? Are we sad about our own sins? Are we sad and convicted about the sins of the world? Does that sadden us? And does that sadness then lead us to hunger for righteousness, to hunger <clears throat> for um, <clears throat> the spiritual things in life that will fill that, that, that spiritual hunger? <clears throat> and so think about that this morning and just <clears throat> recognize the fact that <clears throat> you don't always have to know Greek, and I don't know a lot of Greek. I mean, I had Greek for a year, but it doesn't mean I know it. But sometimes when we look at passages and we pull out a word and see what it means, it really kind of opens up a different, a, a broader view of what he's talking about there than just a surface reading. And so when I looked that word up, <clears throat> satisfied, foddered up, spiritually all your needs are met. You're going to be stuffed spiritually, and that's the way your father cares for you. That's the way he wants you to feel and wants you to know that's what you have in Christ. All your spiritual needs are met. <clears throat> and so if the men would come forward. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you. As we prepare to take this bread, it represents the body of Jesus and all that he went through to bring us forgiveness from sins, to show us how to live and how to trust in you. Help us to be hungry, Father, for the fulfillment of spirit in our lives. Bless us now as we partake, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And after the bread, Christ took the cup and he blessed it. Lord, we know this cup is so important. It was a new covenant that you brought to the world. And you gave us the model. You showed us that it can be followed. It can be kept. Because of your love, we should show love to others and emulate God in our lives. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
we remembered what uh, our Savior did for us and what he gave us. It, we're also asked that each week that we come together that we think about what was been given to us materially and that we think about that, we prosper in our hearts to give back to him that which is his. So let's pray now. Almighty Father, Lord, it is a, it is a privilege to be called your son. And Lord, we, as I look at my life and we look at our lives, Lord, we know that we've been given so much. And Lord, um, as we give back now, Lord, we pray that, that we've looked at our lives and looked at our hearts and give back to you the, the things from, a, from an abundance, Father, and we give to you from our need. And Lord, um, not just in our money, but in our life. And Lord, now we, I pray that we do so cheerfully and gratefully. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There's a stirring deep within me, could it be my time has come? When I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done, is that his voice I am hearing? Come away, my precious one. Is he calling me? Is he calling me? I will rise up, rise up, and bow down and lay my crown at his wounded feet. I will rise up, rise up, and bow down and lay Stirring deep within me. Good morning. Going to try and go cough drop free today. We'll see what happens. A uh, couple of new members to introduce today. Wanted to wanted you to welcome the Schnupp family. Gary, Rhonda, Ella. Raise, wave your hands. Everybody probably knows them by now. They've been hanging around for a while, but it's official. They are members here, so welcome. There. I understand. Yes. Thank you, Jackie. I understand they're kind of scooting out to go up to Penn State to visit their son as soon as we're done this morning, so you may not get a chance to talk to him today, but introduce yourself if you haven't already. It is, uh, I just, I wanted to put, the, I always put the date up there for the first slide. I, I wanted to show you something you, you have probably never seen. I don't even think Bledsoe has seen this. Um, this is today's date. It's a palindrome, 02, 02, 2020. The last time that happened was November 11th, 1111. A long time ago, Jim, you don't remember that, right? I've been really hitting you hard on the age, on the date, your age lately. Uh, but I just thought it would be fun to put that up there. It is Super Bowl Sunday, and Andy, I can hardly look at you. I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's been a while since the Niners have been in the Super Bowl. I, I have not recovered from the 80s. So uh, I'll be there with the youth group tonight rooting for the Chiefs. Um, anyway, we've been in Revelation. And turn in your Bibles to get there. We do. I shouldn't be babbling here. We've got a lot of ground to cover in a little amount of time today. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 6 and 7 today, and as always, it is in your best interest to follow along. There's only so much we can really take the time to talk about. You'll notice some things you have questions about that we're going to skip over. It's just, it's just inevitable, as we, unless we want to do this for a year or two, and we don't want to do that. So uh, last week in, in Revelation, we looked at chapters 4 and 5, and, and they helped us to answer the question, who is really Lord and God? Who, who is it really? Because in John's day, remember, he's writing this book to those original readers, those original listeners. They're living at a time in the Roman Empire when the Roman emperor is saying, I am Lord and God, and you will address me as Lord and God. And so that's, that's a hard thing to deal with. What do you do? And so uh, the beautiful thing about chapter 4 and 5 
Uh, it builds us up before later on we, we're going to start to see uh, some hard times ahead. And one of the things that it does for us is that it helps us uh, answer that question. And it does it by, as Apocalypse does, by pulling back the curtain, by saying, here's what it looks like out in front. Here's how things seem. But look, let, us show you, let me show you what's really happening. And so it takes us to the great throne room of God. And we discover that, that it is, in fact, on the throne, that the one true living God is on the throne and that he is there with the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, his son, who is also worthy of worship. And so God seems to be saying, as he gets us ready for some stuff that you're going to see today, if you have not read ahead, uh, some difficult things, he's getting us ready to understand that whatever comes after this, no matter how bad it may get, don't worry. Don't worry. Those who stay faithful, he says, will become priests in an eternal kingdom. What could be better than that? That's a promise for those who persevere and follow God. And yet, there's the scroll. <laughs> you know, we finished chapter 5 last week, and we, there was this whole discussion of who is worthy to open the scroll and these seven seals. And think of this, we didn't really talk about this last week, think of this as a document sort of sealed in the old-time way, a wax seal with a signet that, that uh, has to be broken before you can open it. And this, this scroll from God, seven seals that bind it. And this is a problem. This scroll is very mysterious and those seals make it, make it ominous. And we know again that only the lamb is worthy of opening the scroll, the seals, but we, we shudder a bit. If you're reading this, you can't help but shudder a little bit when you get to chapter six and he actually starts to do it. And we're being prepped that this is going to be difficult. And so when he finally starts to open those scrolls, it's, it's an incredible thing. Now, probably the best way for us to think of, of this scroll and these seals is that as each seal is opened, what is happening is God is unveiling a, a part of his plan, something that's going to happen. Uh, a, a slow unveiling or revealing of things that are, uh, that are going to happen, some in the very near future, some much further out. Uh, but all things that are going to happen. And God is going to give us a little peek into what those things are. And I have to tell you, much of the unfolding, much of this unveiling is going to be faith-shaking. It's hard to read it and not wonder how you would react if you were the one experiencing this sort of thing. And so it's critical, again, that as God's people that we remember as we're reading it, who is on the throne? Because we're going to be tempted to, to be distracted into all sorts of other different areas. Uh, before we get back into the text, uh, one of the things I've been pondering, we've, we've talked here quite a bit in some of our Bible classes, I've, I think I've mentioned it in some sermons from time to time, about the rise in America of a group of people that have been classified as the nuns. That's not N-U-N, that's N-O-N-E, nun. And what this represents is uh, you perhaps filled out a census form or some form of document that at some point as you're going through it and you're answering all these invasive personal questions about your life, they want to know about your religious affiliation. And the nuns, the so-called nuns, are the people in our country who when they come to that question of religion, they check the box that says, none. I got no religion. I, I don't follow or observe anything. Uh, what's interesting is in America, historically, we are, I think it's one of the reasons why we, we'd like ourselves to be a Christian nation to a much greater extent than we actually are. But, but in our history, more, more than anything else, more Americans have traditionally uh, considered themselves to be Christian, no matter what they really believed or how they really lived. But, but for generations, for much of our history, when people went through these kinds of things, when they came to the box, what is your religious affiliation? They would check Christian. And that's the vast majority of, Mer of Americans would say, yes, I'm a Christian. And yet, one of the weird things that's happening in our country, especially over the last 20 years or so, is that the nuns, who for so long were a very small minority in our country, have grown and grown and grown. This, the last graph I saw only goes to 2016. My understanding is that last year, officially, that number has now grown to more than 30% of people in America who, when, are, when they're asked, well, what is, your, what is your religious affiliation? They say none. 30%, a third. It is now arguably the largest single group. Uh, Protestant Christianity as a collection is still a little bigger than this, but, but fr Protestant Christianity, as we know, is fractured up into a lot of small groups. This may be the largest group of Americans now represented. And I read an article, it's been some time now, a couple of years ago, um, but the author was speculating that perhaps one of the reasons for this is that in America, our culture has changed, and now in America, people more and more are starting to see that the cost of being a Christian maybe is starting to outweigh the benefits. Now that's a very, 
depends on how you answer that question. I think all of us uh, as Christians, as, as followers of Jesus, to the best of our ability, we understand that, that, that I would want to say, well, what do you mean by that? And we understand that the greatest benefits of being a follower of Jesus are the spiritual benefits. And so this is really not talking about that. This author really was talking about the cultural blessings. And so if you look at this from a purely cultural perspective, even then, I don't think that we're quite there yet, but it's not hard to imagine. It's not hard to imagine a time in America where culturally the benefits of being a Christian may outweigh the the negatives of being a Christian, that we may not have that special status that we've had for so long. And we have had favored status in America, but it is, it's eroding. It depends on who you talk to, how fast it's eroding, how how long we may still have where we're still sort of given preferential treatment. But I think it's fair to ask ourselves, as I have asked us the last two weeks to think about this question, what are the pros and cons of being a Christian. What are the positives and the negatives? If you did that old, my kids made college decisions this way. You draw a line and trust the top pros and cons and you write them down and you, you try to judge, well, what, what's the best decision? And, and how would you answer that for being a Christian? John's original readers live in a time in which it is distinctly to their disadvantage to follow Jesus. The culture that they live in makes it harder to, on followers of Jesus than on those who are not. And, and we'll see that if we haven't already in Revelation. Believe me, we're going to understand that. And I wonder how many of us would still publicly claim to follow Jesus if in our lifetimes following Jesus became a cultural liability. How many of us? How many of us would still, would still be here in this building today if the time came that that they could say, well, you know, those followers of Jesus, we're not going to let them have jobs or at least good jobs anymore. Or maybe, you know, what if the time came in our country where uh, they said, you know, people who follow Jesus, we're not going to let them live in good neighborhoods anymore. They're only going to be able to live, you know, like as with the Jews and we're we'll stick them in a ghetto somewhere. Or, you know, what if, it, what if there are, you know, other economic consequences? What if there are, what if it becomes more likely that as followers of Jesus, if they can identify us, that we may end up in prison? What happens if that happens? And how many of us will be overcome by that idea of what's happening to us or what might happen to us, forgetting that we have now seen behind the curtain into the throne room of God, and we know who's on the throne. We know it is God. We know it is the Lamb. We know it is not whoever is in power. How many of us will forget that when in culture it becomes harder to follow Jesus? I think that's an important question. And I think we need to ponder that as we enter into chapter 6 this morning and as the Lamb begins to open the seals on this scroll. Chapter 6 through really through chapter 20 from now almost to the end of this of this incredible book uh, it's going to begin to describe really in all of its glory and all of its terror the judgment of God. And remember again I will keep reiterating this is this is figurative language this is a vision but but yet, it draws us in. And so I put up today on the side screens a vision of the opening of the first four of the seals on this scroll. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it today, but I do think it's important each week as we try to get to some of the bigger concepts here that we also spend a little time walking through what we're reading because it's hard. It's hard to understand. And, and so we're going to do our best to try to figure out some of these things. We're going to ignore some other stuff because we don't have time. We'll do our best. But we find ourselves here uh, in chapter 6, starting in verse 1, the Lamb opens the first seal. I don't know what you're expecting at this point if you've never read this, but what you're going to start to see for these first couple seals in particular is they're going to reveal a horse and a rider, but they're all going to be a little different. If you ask me, they're all going to be pretty terrifying. And so the lamb opens the first seal and and a rider on a white horse appears. Uh, And we come to probably believe that this is most likely a a conqueror, somebody who's going to come into this land where where they are living and he's going to ravage the land and he's going to ravage the people who are occupying the land, which at this point we know is the Roman Empire. And so this is a, a prediction of some things that will come to pass. We know history tells us they did come to pass. Now, some people look at this rider on the white horse and they say, well, that's Jesus. And in fact, uh, back in chapter 14, there is a rider on a white horse and he will be Jesus, or excuse me, chapter 19. Um, And so maybe. The weird thing is Jesus is the one opening the seal. So can he be the one opening the seal and can he also be what comes out of that first seal? Maybe. It's a vision. It's figurative. But I lean toward probably not. And then the lamb the lamb is ready. He's there. He's going to open the second seal. And the second seal reveals a, 
a red horse, a fiery red horse, a dangerous red horse. And this rider has a sword and he's given power. He's given power to create chaos. And so perhaps it's war and it's aftermath. Uh, Some would say that that first horse represents uh, conquest and perhaps this second horse and rider represent maybe civil war because that's gonna happen in the Roman Empire as well. And then starting in verse five, we see the third seal being opened and it reveals a a black horse. And this horse seems a little less threatening. This rider has uh, scales. He talks about, you know, weights and measures. That doesn't seem all that intimidating until we start to think about what happens during war and especially what happens oftentimes to what we would call the non-combatants in war. Because when you're fighting a war, all the resources go to the army. When you're in the war, all the resources go toward the, the military action that your country, you know, you're defending your, your empire, you're defending your way of life or whatever. And so oftentimes the people who are at home are left to deal with uh, scarcities of things that they need. They're, they're left to deal with rising prices. It becomes harder and harder to get the things you need to survive. And so this probably here is a foreshadowing of the terrible lengths that people will have to go to when all of these things come to pass just to make it day to day because it's going to be hard to find food. And if you can find it, it's going to be expensive. And it's going to be hard to find, uh, to, to find shoes for your children's feet and gas for your car or whatever. It's going to be hard to find these things. And so life is going to get a lot more difficult. They didn't actually need gas for their cars in the Roman Empire. I do know that. Wheels for their chariots. Let's go there. Shoes for their horses. And then the fourth seal. And this will be the last of its type, and this is a pale horse. Uh, The language here seems to indicate uh, a horse that is sickly. And he has an interesting rider. Its rider is death, and not just death, but Hades is following close behind. We've talked about Hades earlier as the, the, the realm of the dead or perhaps the conscious realm of the condemned dead. When we talk about Hades, nobody's happy. And yet here is Hades riding with this horse and these riders, death and Hades, are empowered to kill. They're given the power to take human life. Now, the good news is there's some, there's some restrictions there. It talks about how they're only given authority over, the, over a fourth of the world. And so this seems to indicate that, that God has said, I'm not gonna let them just kill indiscriminately. I'm gonna put some limits on their power. But yet here it is, death and destruction as a part of this. And I gotta tell you, if you're reading this, you may be a little worn out. <laughs> Because that's a lot of scary stuff in just a few short verses. And these are, these are things that are apparently taking place or about to take place, as John writes, things that are going to happen on earth. And what they appear to be revealing, and this is really important, we'll talk more next week about why we would approach it this direction rather than some other direction. This appears to be a peek behind the curtain at an empire that's in trouble. The Roman Empire, which is causing so much trouble for these Christians on the surface, uh, is at the height, the peak of its power, the peak of empire, the peak of its influence. Uh, They are the great persecutors of the followers of Jesus, and it seems like nothing can stop them. But in reality, God says, no, they're already teetering on the brink of disaster. They just don't know it yet. These things are coming. The empire's not going to last forever. And, and oh, hey, we look around. There's no Roman Empire anymore. And there hasn't been for 1,500 years. And so he's right. But, you know, it's hard to believe that when you're living it. It's hard to accept that when you're in the middle of it. Funny thing about prophecy, and I, I struggle with this. Um, anytime you read something prophetic in the Bible, it's hard to know, uh, you know, whether God is saying, here's what's going to happen because I'm going to make it happen. That happens sometimes. And then sometimes God says, no, I'm not going to make this happen, but I I know what's going to happen. I'm just going to let you know what's going to happen. I don't know whether this is one or the other, but it is not hard to read here God's judgment on Rome. Rome has been an obstacle. Rome has been a barrier. Rome has been an adversary to God and to his people. And so God is judging Rome. But now it starts to get a little more personal because the opening of the fifth seal does not reveal another scary horse The fifth seal reveals a group of martyrs. Martyrs, people, Christians who have died, who have been killed specifically because they stood up and said, I'm a follower of Jesus. They didn't get executed because they they committed a capital crime. They didn't do something, you know, we would say, well, that deserves the chair. No, they were executed because they stood up and said, I'm a Christian and I don't care who knows it. And the thing is, this collection of dead martyrs, they're gathered there around the throne and they're crying out to God. They're crying with with one united, powerful voice. They're crying for justice. 
I mean, you can imagine being in that situation, right? We have been wronged. We followed Jesus. We were executed. We didn't do anything bad. God, give us justice. And so it's not hard to believe that they would be crying out for that in chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Now, the thing is, we know or should know that their death has not been in vain. And there, here, here again, the symbolism of Revelation, these martyrs are wearing white robes. And in Revelation, white uh, symbolizes victory. And so God is saying, no, you, you've won the victory. You've won the eternal victory. But God's answer to them as they cry out for justice is not what they want to hear. God says, in effect, it's not time yet. Justice is coming. I will bring justice, but I will bring justice on my timetable. And I think, you know, um, how often our, our faith is stretched when we go through times of trial. And we cry out to God. We want relief. We want we, want, we don't just want relief, but we want relief now. You know, how often have you prayed that prayer in the middle of a personal crisis, in the middle of a health issue, whatever, something going on with your kids, somebody you care about, you pray, and you don't just say to God, hey, whenever you get around to it, you're like, God, fix this and fix it now. That's how we are. We, we want God to do what we think he should do, what we think he should do, and we want him to do it when we think he should do it. That's how we're wired, and yet God is not subject to my timeline. He's not subject to your timeline. We live on his timeline. And here's a reminder of that. Justice will come, God says, but it'll come when I am ready to administer it. And so God's people need to step back and say, okay, you are God, you are on the throne, and we are not. And then the sixth seal, the sixth seal is open, and we see a vision. I don't know how to describe it a great cosmic disturbance. The kind of thing that if you were in the middle of it and it happened, you would look around and you would go, oh, surely this is the end of the world. It's that kind of thing. And it's, hard, it's hard to read this without, without sort of trying to imagine what you would do in that place. Would you stand and gawk at, at, at what is happening as the stars are falling and the world is being re-something? I don't know. Or would you be screaming in terror? Would you die of a heart attack? I don't, I don't know. This is the wrath of God and of the Lamb being poured out on the world. It is God's righteous judgment. And those who are experiencing it are doing what I think any of us would do. They are crying out in terror. They are terrified. Who can possibly face this? This that we read in chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. Who could possibly deal with that? Well, the good news is we're about to find out. And the good news is that even from this incredible display of judgments there will be some that God will preserve. There will be those he has identified. There will be those who he, he has sealed uh, to, to identify them, to label them. They're described here, interestingly, as being 144,000 people. Um, that is a very specific number. I don't know how you first react to that when you see that number. My first reaction to that is, if this is all the people who are going to be in heaven, that ain't very many people. There's been a lot of billions and billions of people who have lived forever and ever, and I believe I'm going to heaven, not because I'm good, but because God is gracious. But there's only going to be 144,000? Is that what this means? Well, probably not. Um, this is one of the places where we could just pause and spend a month talking about numbers in Revelation. We're not going to do that. But this number does get talked about a lot, so it's important that we pause here and mention a few things. If you are premillennial and you're thinking, we'll explain more about that uh, in, uh, in the near future. Um, premillennialists would say the 144,000 represents all of the Jews that God has redeemed who will be in heaven someday. If you come out of a background of uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses tend to believe that this is going to be the exact number of faithful Christians that will someday reign with Jesus in heaven. And so it is a, a small number. There is a, there's an ongoing struggle in Revelation with figurative language. And there's this danger of how literal do we take it? How far do we go? And, and it becomes more problematic if you read a little further back in uh, chapter 14. There's other references to, uh, to the 144,000. And if you sort of put all these together... And you start, you're going to say, well, we're going to take all this literally. Well, you're going to come to the conclusion that the 144,000 who will be in heaven someday will have to be A, Jewish, B, male, C, a virgin, and D, they will have to have never told a lie in their life. So what are we doing here today? <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, 
I mean, there's a couple of us maybe who could qualify with one or two of those, but all four, I'm not thinking so many. So is that what this is about? Much more likely is that this number is, again, symbolic, as most numbers in Revelation tend to be. Uh, it is most likely a, a multiplication, a factoring up of some significant Bible numbers that are uh, the numbers 12 and 10 who, that, are, that generally in the scriptures represent completeness, that represent totality. Again, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but so the 144,000, don't think of this as, a, as a, a specific number of people. What this represents is all of some group of people, the total number of some group or classification of people. And the best fit for this that makes the most sense in scripture is that this represents all of those who are living in John's time who have stayed faithful to the Messiah. All the ones that John is addressing as he writes, all, the whole, the total group of those who have, who have faced up to Rome and said, I'm not gonna give in, I'm not gonna worship the emperor. I'm gonna follow the one true living God. And so we can think of this as a vision of, of the whole church, all the saved on the earth as the time of the seven seals being opened. There's other stuff about the seals. It goes back to Ezekiel and how God identifies them. We're running out of time and I want to move on. But then the, the scene does shift one more time. The second half of chapter seven. And suddenly we're not looking at things that are happening on earth anymore. Now we're back in the throne room of God and something incredible is happening there. We're watching a group standing before the throne, a, a great multitude. And it says in verse 14, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And here again, we see the redeemed. All of them, the, the total number of the redeemed, God's people, all of them throughout history assembled before the throne. It is all who have been faithful in their witness, even when it was hard to be faithful. It is all who have not renounced their faith, but who, but who have stayed committed to being disciples of Jesus, even if it had been easier on them, if they had turned their backs on him. You can't help but notice as you read, this bunch has a distinctly international flavor. I didn't used to really notice that that much. And then this church started to change. And this passage started to, and others like it in Revelation, started to mean more to me. These redeemed are from every nation and from all tribes and peoples and languages. We've got to brace ourselves. Uh, when we get to heaven someday, there's going to be people there who are not Americans. Eesh. Can you imagine? There are going to be people there that, now again, I have a vision, this is a vision of what is little, but clearly the idea is that people, there's going to be people there whose first language was not English. There's going to be people there whose skin color is different than my skin color, your skin color, and uh, whose customs as they lived out their lives in faithfulness to Jesus on this earth were not like my customs. And it seems in heaven more and more we come to understand that the only citizenship that matters is our heavenly citizenship. That's the only one that means anything. When you get there, I don't care what your passport is. I don't care you know, what, your, what your history is. If you're going to be in heaven, you've got to be okay with this idea that it's going to be full of people that are not like you. And I think as we try to live today as people of the kingdom, some of us need to start now to kind of adjust our thinking about about that because we're struggling with people who are different than us sometimes wanting to keep us divided and that's not going to work it doesn't work in the kingdom now it's not going to work in the kingdom to which we all aspire well there's a there's a lot more to talk about here the time does not allow but what we've witnessed i think in chapter seven is a vision of the church. Again, the, the saved, those who've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, but through, we could say, kind of through two different lenses, or maybe better to say from two different points on the timeline. And so as you look at chapter seven and you look at the first eight verses, what we see is the church on earth, and it is sealed. Again, God, God identifies who his followers are, who the redeemed are, and he seals them and, and reinforces uh, that they are his people as they get ready for a time of trial that is coming things that they are about to face. John is getting them ready for things that they are going to experience. And so that's, that's the first half of the chapter. And then in verse nine, a view of the church in heaven, a view of the church after Jesus has returned and after all the things that we talk about have happened. And at this point, it is a vision of the church triumphant. It is a vision of the church at peace because the trials are over and the redeemed are experiencing eternal life to the fullest. 
What an incredible vision this is. This, this literally is before and after. And the challenging part for all of God's people, whether they are John's original readers way back in, in 90 or 95 AD or whether they are us today or some future generation a thousand years from now, the challenge for God's people in any place, at any time, in any language is staying faithful to Jesus during the before so that someday we can experience the after. A reminder as we close today. We can't lose sight of the fact that as we go through Revelation, there is the reality of that fifth seal. Remember what happens? We get away from the horses. We think everything's good. And then we have this vision of martyrs. There are martyrs. There are a lot of martyrs. There are a lot of people who die because of what they believe, because they agree to follow Jesus and they're not going to compromise. And so God identifies his redeemed. God protects his redeemed. But that does not necessarily mean that God's redeemed will escape suffering. It doesn't mean that. In fact, sometimes God's redeemed will be called to suffer. Peter writes eloquently, eloquently about this. Paul writes eloquently about this. Jesus brings this up fairly often. Sometimes God's people will be called to suffer. Many of us in this country have never really suffered for our faith. I'm not saying we should go seek it out, but it is worth mentioning and wondering what will happen, what will happen to you if at some point you start to suffer for what you believe, for standing up and saying, I belong to Jesus Christ. Will you be faithful in your witness no matter the consequences or, or will you decide it's just easier to become a nun? Well, I've read a little over. I hope not too much. Um, next week, we're gonna engage or begin to engage with chapter eight. Uh, chapter eight's where it starts to get a little weird. <laughs> so uh, if you've been thinking, you know, this is already weird. Well, it's going to get weirder. Uh, so I think before we really get too much into the next couple chapters, we need to pause a little bit. We need to spend some time talking about some of the major perspectives on this book and why people interpret it in different ways. Uh, it's funny, uh, if you, I, I never would encourage anybody to go Google a question that you have about Revelation because the, you would not believe that, that this, how many different ideas there are, how many crazy ideas there are. Uh, so we need to talk about why that is. We need to talk about the choices that I've been making and how they affect how I look at this book and present things to you. And I think mostly that's what we're going to get done next week. Um, it would do well for you to read ahead if you can and to read chapters 8 through 11. Um, and again, read some out loud if possible. It changes the way that you process it. It's such a visual, powerful book when we hear it. And so read some out loud and don't get frustrated if you don't understand it because you're not gonna understand it. And we'll talk about some next week and maybe we'll understand it. My goal each week is that we all just understand it a little better, but we're never gonna get it all. Don't try to get it all, don't expect to get it all, but let's dig in and get what we can get. And Ryan, let's stand and sing praises to the one who knows and redeems his people. Let's do that, let's stand and sing. Let's sing the first verse only. There's a peace I've come to know, though my heart and flesh may fail. There's an anchor for my soul, I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain, I will rise on eagle's wings before my God, fall on my knees and rise, I will Be seated, please.
Okay, just a couple highlights, and I'm going to start with uh, a very important one first. We need some helpers for Sunday school this morning. Um, Ken George is going to have to cover the two and three year old class by himself this morning and could really use a helper. So, could someone please help Ken out this morning on the two and three year olds? You don't have to teach, you just got what? We already got it. Boy, I like this. What else do I need? Okay, let's see. Let's run down the list. Okay, that went well. How about we need a pre-K helper for all of February? And oh, by the way, this is the first week of February. So we need somebody to help out with the pre-K children. Again, you don't have to teach. We just need an extra helper. So please see Amber afterwards if you can help out here for a couple weeks. And uh, thank you for stepping up and helping Ken out this morning. Okay, that's out of the way. That was the most important. Uh, we do have, uh, uh, there is something called the Super Bowl going on today, and I think the youth are getting together at 6 o'clock tonight for that uh, Super Bowl party, so keep that in mind. Uh, next week we have our annual congregational meeting. It'll be happening during Sunday school in here, so uh, please stick around as we kind of highlight what happened last year and what we're thinking about and what's going on for the coming year, so please uh, make that a point of sticking around for that. Also in the bulletin, I'm just highlighting a couple things here quick, the youth group the leadership there is looking to get someone to help out with a monthly youth small group. So please check in that, see if you can help out and take uh, some of those and, and help get those, those guys together and help them to continue to grow. Also, uh, Geritol Games is for anybody 55 years and over, and it's on the 15th of February, the day after Valentine's Day at noon. You can sign up on the website, you can sign up on the kiosk. If you don't want to feel up, you don't feel like dealing with the technology, see any of us with a badge and we will get you signed up. Please, uh, please participate in that. It seems to be growing. Uh, there's more information on that in the bulletin, but uh, let's get you signed up for that on the 15th of February. I think that's it. There's a lot of other stuff, so please check it out in there, but those were the highlights that I felt important to bring to your attention. If you're visiting with us, thanks for being here. Stick around for a couple minutes. Let us get to know you. We do have classes starting here in about 20 minutes uh, here in this uh, sanctuary as well as classrooms two and three. We have a Hispanic class, so there's a lot going on here. Uh, we have coffee and donuts waiting for us when we get done here. So please uh, stick around. Why don't we close with a word of prayer? Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Even though at times, uh, sometimes it can be very difficult for us and our human minds to understand, we continually strive to learn your word and live by it. And we're thankful for that. We're thankful for this body. We pray that you'll be with us as we head out this today and go into the next coming week. Please help us to live Christ's life and let other people see you in us. In Jesus' name, amen.